Yo, yo. What's up, people? Hotep Jesus. We're back. I have a special series lined up here for you guys. Uh, straight from my book, hmm. The Patriot Report. Link is in the description box below. Uh, you go ahead and get a digital copy, I think, for 14 bucks on my website, hotepjesus.com. And you can go ahead and get a physical copy for $29 uh, on Amazon. Uh, physical copies are now available. Uh, quick shout out to Rolo Tomasi. He's the one that put together this great and wonderful and beautiful cover. Uh, today's presentation is on a brief history of uh, finance scams. Uh, mostly as it relates to nations, banks, uh, and companies, corporations. Uh, you'll see many of the libertarians, some of the conservatives will speak of this entity called the Federal Reserve. Uh, one thing I'd like to say, uh, people blame the Federal Reserve for something called fractional reserve banking. And I'd like to go ahead and correct people on that. Um, they are not, in fact, practicing fractional reserve banking. Uh, in order to practice fractional reserve banking, the notes would have to be backed by a reserve. You would have to have some sort of reserves of whatever these notes are going to be redeemable in. Now, if anybody knows anything about the United States dollar, you cannot redeem it for gold or silver um, from the issuer. You can buy gold and silver, but you cannot redeem its value in gold. Uh, from its issuer. So again, people say it's fractional reserve banking, but in order to have fractional reserve banking, you would have to have some reserves and that currency would have to be backed by some resource or uh, whatever uh, it's being allegedly uh, backed by. Um, now, today's presentation, um, I've set up a couple of slides here, which I'll bring up on the screen in just a moment. Uh, but today's presentation is going to go into, uh, you see, people think this, this Federal Reserve thing is new, right? This idea of the fractional reserve notes and so on and so forth. And um, uh, shout out to uh, TVTX89. Thank you for 99 Super Chat. Showing love for all the great content you put out. Thank you. Appreciate you, homie. Um, yeah, go ahead and drop a super chat. You got questions or comments. I'm definitely going to read those for y'all. But this finance, what I would call scam, is actually um, a bit older than you may believe. Some, think, some people uh, date it back to 1913, as we all know. What's the year of the IRS? And also, um, hey, can I get a cup of coffee? Cup of coffee? 1913 Federal Reserve Act was passed. So, without further ado, we're going to get to the presentation. We're going to talk today about a gentleman by the name of Jock Law, John Law. And he is, allegedly, the inventor of the stock market bubble. Now, um, before we uh, move forward, let me um, just read uh, this passage from my book uh, to describe this John Law to you so you have an idea about this guy. Now, it says here, this John Law can be succinctly described as a convicted murderer international celebrity, gambler, and spy, but most notably the inventor of the stock market bubble. 
you may get the wrong idea about law by describing him as a convicted murderer. To clarify, he won a duel, which was seen as a noble way two men can handle a dispute in those days. But he, he lost in the courts, thus deeming him a convicted murderer. Uh, his father was a goldsmith, and as a result, his family was wealthy. As an adult, Law squandered his inheritance due to his gambling habit. His mother bailed him out of debt, and then Law began to study the mathematics of probability. This science would pay dividends for his gambling habit as he started to create wealth from gambling. This was probably similar to what we call card counting today. After escaping from jail for murder, he would eventually make his way to Amsterdam, the economic capital of Europe. This is where he began studying the system of paper. Paper money. So, um, yes, uh, without knowing the history, you're doomed to repeat it. Absolutely, uh, TBT. So let me bring uh, the slide back up. Oh, it's coming right now. Thank you, sir. So, Amsterdam had a central bank. Uh, law went all around, John Law went all around Europe trying to study this, uh, these financial systems of Europe. And um, Amsterdam happened to be the economic capital of Europe at the time. We're talking uh, 17th, 18th century uh, Europe. Uh, they did, in fact, have a gold back currency. That means you could turn in your notes uh, for gold. So they weren't practicing fractional reserve banking. Um, Cash is can find out super chat says, speaking of scams, what's up with the infrastructure bill and the impact on crypto? Uh, been told y'all they were going to do this after the cyber hacks. Yeah, um, I might do a presentation on that too. Um, uh, doing my research on it now. Uh, I, I have to really break down um, the bill and uh, read, read it line by line. Uh, I don't want to go based upon other people's interpretations if I'm going to do a presentation on it. So again, uh, Amsterdam's uh, currency uh, was not fractional. It was backed by gold. And uh, the currency was oftentimes worth more than gold. So let's, let's talk about that briefly. Um, so what happens is, uh, if you know that this currency is redeemable in gold, you can begin to speculate on the currency. And people start trading. And they start trading um, based on uh, the future of said nation, saying, oh, you know, it could be a potential that this nation becomes richer and richer. And then if the nation becomes richer and richer, these notes could become more valuable. So there was a little mini market uh, for an exchange um, of currency that took place uh, in Amsterdam. This is the power of having a strong currency imagine having a currency where it's worth more than gold that would be amazing that would be uh, absolutely amazing let's go back to the slide here so law went around uh to many nations he stopped by the queen of scotland and uh, his reputation preceded him you know he was looked at as a gambler a hustler a swindler, a murderer. And uh, what he wanted to do was he proposed a land back currency. Basically, the currency would be backed by the land. Uh, and he wanted to do this in exchange for a pardon. He also tried this in, in Vienna, as you see, and it was also denied. Yes, future market best. Thank you, Peter Rossi. Um, but, so he was denied. So where would he go? Where could he go to pull off his little scam? Well, he went to the most impoverished European nation. At the time, that was France. Now, France had been involved in many wars under King Louis XIV. Uh, and they fell into, uh, now at this point, a third bankruptcy. So the Duke of New Orleans, the nephew of the King of King Louis XIV, uh, became the regent. Louis XIV, I think, died previously, maybe the year before, something like that. Um, I don't remember the years. 
So he, he died and uh, the regent, uh, uh, the Duke of New Orleans became the new regent and uh, became a perfect opportunity for John Law to uh, set up his scam. So he negotiated with this regent and said, hey, look, I'm gonna help you guys out and, and resolve your debt issue, right? So one of the first things he did was he, he set up a bank and he introduced this, this idea of, uh, of banking, right? And, and paper money. France did not have uh, paper money. They were still uh, trading in gold and whatnot. So he introduced them to paper money that he learned from, um, from Amsterdam. Um, and then later on, you know, make a long story short, um, he learned from the Dutch East Indian Company and did this uh, debt swap thing uh, with this thing called the Mississippi Company. Basically, you know, the debtors, uh, you know, the debt holder could swap the debt for shares in the Mississippi Company and start speculating. Uh, the Mississippi Company uh, basically held um, held uh, the the area that we call Louisiana, but Louisiana at that time was a, a whole section of middle America. It wasn't just what we see today as Louisiana, you know, um, uh, France, France owned that land. Uh, as you know about the Louisiana purchase, some of you may know, uh, some years later, that land will be lifted from France's possession. And that's uh, so why we got New Orleans, you know, named after Orleans, uh, so on and so forth. And, um, yeah, so uh, people people basically thought that this land had natural resources and so on and so forth. And there was, um, I'm sorry, there was, and they thought there was gold and silver and all these promises. Anybody knows anything about Louisiana? Ain't nothing but swap out there. So, and I always talk about this, you know, a lot of people, they'd say, um, you know, they talk about black people and slaves and so on and so forth. And um, I always like to let them know that, you know, a uh, white man was the first slave, slave, indentured servant on this land. You know, it was the dregs of society, the lower class that were forced to go and uh, settle America. The same thing happened here. The French, they sent French and Germans over to uh, settle this Louisiana territory, right? And uh, swamp alligators, no natural resources, can't really grow nothing out there. Well, what happened? People started dying, right? Now I'm jumping a gun a bit, but just wanted to give you that so you understand how this thing um, will eventually begin to collapse. Um. If you have questions, go ahead and super chat and I'll get right to them. So shares become publicly traded. They start sharing, they start selling shares in this company to not to the public. Um, you know, uh, rich and poor are both alike. Rich became richer, poor became no longer poor. And the word millionaire was born. If you guys ever heard the word millionaire, now you know where the word millionaire comes from. It comes from uh, France uh, and this, uh, in this in this stock market bubble. Uh, shout out to Khaled Cooper, 2499, Super Chat. Appreciate you, homie. Where's my, where's my, uh, what's the name? That's a big one. Appreciate you, homie. So the term millionaire is born. Now, we're getting to the financial scam of things. Uh, so they set up uh, this thing called the Bank General. Like I said before, they started issuing paper notes. France wasn't sophisticated at the time. People were still walking around with gold. And if you know anything about gold, if you got a lot of it, it's kind of hard to transport. It just doesn't make a very good means of exchange, Whole, good, good means of uh, store of value. But not as not not exactly a good method of exchange or means of exchange. Paper money works a lot better. Some people don't like paper money, but paper money actually works really well when you can trust the bank. So um, they set up the 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 bank general, right? Um, he said there's a ton of oil off the coast of Louisiana. Indeed, indeed, they I guess they hadn't um, figured that out uh, yet uh, in those days. 
uh, 17th, 18th century. So, uh, like I said before, there was a lot of speculation around gold in Louisiana territory. And, uh, he got a little, he got a little ambitious and, uh, what he started doing was he, you know, to get people to, to incentivize people to uh, buy shares. He was paying dividends on, on said shares. The problem is um, he was uh, running a Ponzi scheme. And uh, basically what the Ponzi scheme did was he was basically paying the dividends from money that came from selling new shares. It wasn't profits from the actual company. It was depending on selling new shares and giving dividends to the old investors. And if you don't anything about the Ponzi scheme, you got to keep finding a new sucker to keep that thing going. Uh, the bank itself. Uh, uh, actually, what happened was. Um, the bank, uh, I'm sorry, the company started uh, selling shares in these in these notes. And then and the notes became tradable for shares and so on and so forth. So because there was an explosion in shares or an explosion in speculation, they had to print more money and they ended up printing more money than they had to go reserves. Uh, thank you, LS Miles. And uh, I believe it was only about 20% of gold actually existed, um, actually existed uh, uh, compared to the printed money. So word got out and uh, there was a run on the banks. I, I believe a prince came through and took away like three wagons worth of gold or something like that. Yeah, like the former Bernie Madoff. And uh, the run began. Uh he said, yo, H.J., do you think John Calvin intended for such high interest lending to become normal like we see today? Lending to collect interest was illegal. Um, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. It's really hard to judge people's intentions. Um, I hate to judge people's intentions, um, but I think it's very important that we look at um, uh, the after effects. You know, what happened and then what happened afterwards. I think that's the smartest thing to do. Uh, and look at things objectively and not really worry about so much the intention. Um, but when you look at the facts, the facts often um, reveal intention or uh, ignorance, uh, either the two. And it's hard to speculate on, on either of those without hard proof. Uh, thank you for the super chat uh, face to the screen. Uh, so, yeah, so they started printing money. And as you know, when you start printing money. Uh, shit goes to hell. So. Um, Let's see. Um, they actually said the money supply doubled in France. Inflation reached a monthly rate of 23%. 23%. Uh, the shares in the Mississippi company started out at 500 livres. Livres? I'm not sure how to pronounce that. It's a French word. And uh, share prices eventually reached 10,000. This is an increase of 1,900% in just under a year. To give you an idea of the type of bubble we're dealing with here. That's wild. Wild. So, next came the failure, the big crash. Like I said before, 80% of the settlers died of disease and starvation. Obviously, word started to travel around, get back to France, and the stock market started to crash. Bank got attacked. John Law fled the country, became a British spy. Now, this would later be succeeded by something called the South Sea company, which would be another bubble. I believe it's called the South Sea Bubble. You can go do your research on the South Sea Bubble. I don't want to take up too much of your time. Um, you said, will there be a paper version of the Patriot Report? Um, it's out right now. Uh, let me go ahead and I'll show you. Uh, Patriot Report right here. It's out on Amazon. You type in the Patriot Report by uh, Brian Sharp. It'll pop right up. 
uh, what I'm going over the state's presentation was uh, a brief history on some of this stuff. You know, even in France, before John Law got there, um, they were devaluing currency. John Law also started, uh, you know, when people wanted to redeem um, their, uh, their gold, they, they issued a bunch of edicts. At one point, they, out, uh, they devalued the gold, so you couldn't redeem for as much gold. Then they outright outlawed gold, gold trading, export of gold and silver. You can no longer redeem um, these notes in gold. Um, bank closed down. But what doesn't that sound familiar? The outlaw? You said you bought the PDF? Good, good. Um, get the PDF and the physical copy. <laughs> get both. Thank you for supporting. The uh, physical copy just went up on Amazon. It's 29 bucks. Um, but where else have you heard that? United States at one point outlawed gold. So people, you know, the reason why I want to do this presentation is because people think that we're unique in this situation. Like America's unique in a situation when this thing is a lot older than that. This thing starts out in the 18th century. Peter Rossi said, who holds the money makes the rules. Indeed. In fact, in fact, um, the Mississippi company, um, hold on now, let me, um, let me, let me find my notes here. But the Mississippi company actually controlled France because the, the, the region actually took over the bank at one point, right? The region took over the bank. John Law was no longer in charge of the bank. So, um, John Law got really creative. And uh, so here it says in se September 17, 18, the company acquired the monopoly in tobacco trading with Africa. Um, in May, he obtained control of the company's trading with China and the East Indies. He renamed his entire business interest the Companies de Indies. Most people still called it the Mississippi Company. In effect, law now controlled all trade with France and the rest of the world outside. Now, check this. It says here, this is from MS History Now, um, uh, .mdah.ms.gov. I'll uh, pop the link right here in the chat. You guys can uh, check that out. You guys can read up uh, on that. Um, but it says, the company next purchased the right to mint new coins for France. And by October, it had purchased the right to collect most of French taxes. So the bank was in control. It was in, under the control of the region, but money talks. So this Mississippi company had purchased the right to collect taxes. It says here in January 1720, law became the controller general and superintendent general of finance. It says here, law now controlled all of France's finance and money creation. He also controlled the company that handled all of France's foreign trade and colonial development. Furthermore, by holding much of, of the French government's debt, he had created a stable source of income for future business ventures. Law had created Europe's most successful conglomerate. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. Uh, we believe that we're unique somehow. We believe that America's unique in, in, in its problem with the bankers. We need to blame John Law. We need to blame France. This is where this stuff first starts. Now, in my book, The Patriot Report, uh, I'll be back. This is not going to be my only presentation. You guys have questions, go ahead and um, super chat them now. Um, I'm going to just uh, give you a preview of what's going to happen in the next presentation. This is on page 39 of my book, The Patriot Report, Conspiracy of Money. As you know, understand this book is uh, a, a history detail uh, on money as it relates to nations and people and their labor being stolen. Um, 
But the next presentation, <coughs> uh, whenever I come back with that, um, I have to put the slides together. Uh, it's going to be a, a lot longer, but we're going to go into um, America. I'm going to go ahead and uh, bring you right to America and let you see. Uh, yes, it was Nixon that stopped the backing of the gold, uh, of the dollar with the gold. Correct. Yeah. Um, but we're going to go into early America. We're going to talk about, um, thank you, James. Appreciate the support. Uh, link is in the description box below. If you want to get a copy of Patriot Report, get it from Amazon. Uh, if you want a digital copy, it's cheaper for me. But we're going to talk about currency problems of the United States of America and early America. I'm talking early, 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 early America. We're going to bust a whole lot of myths. A lot of people believe that the Revolutionary War was fought over taxes. It was not fought over taxes. That is false. That is a falsehood. And I'm going to bust that. Um, he said, uh, uh, Horizon of Zion, what's your thoughts, HJ, on mainstream doing articles on demolishing <coughs> credit card interest <coughs> at 1%? Uh, I, I don't think that's a bad thing. Um, you know, the more money you got, the more money you're willing to, uh, the more money you're willing to spend. Um, also, um, you know, charging interest on, on somebody who's going to be paying off their loans is probably, um, not going to be beneficial in the first place. So, you know, charging interest is probably a waste of time. Um, yeah. Uh, so this has been a, a, a wonderful presentation. Thank you guys for, for stopping by and um, sharing this time with me. Um, I'm working on getting some more interviews up on the channel with um, some great minds. Uh, I tried to get Samantha up here uh, today and waiting for her to respond. Um, and then uh, I'll be back with some more interviews and some, and some more presentations. Go ahead and share this uh, with friends and family. I'm out of here. Be safe. August 26th to the 28th, Las Vegas, Nevada. Hotel Nation Weekend. The world will never be the same. Get your tickets and be a part of the first ever Hotel Nation Weekend. Hotel Nation, a 501c3 nonprofit organization designed to spread the philosophy of hard work and self care, will be hosting a weekend in Vegas with live podcasts, panels, pool party, and much more. Exclusive meet and greets with major figures in the Hotep community, including Hotep Jesus, Uncle Hotep, President Doe Dude, and other special guests. Network and build bridges in the Hotep community. Enjoy Vegas with a cool group of people. All of this can be found at the Hotep Nation Convention. So who is this for? Are you looking to build up your community? This is for you. Are you looking to expand business opportunities? This is for you. Are you looking for an opulent time with nation builders? This is for you. Hotel Nation's first annual convention in Las Vegas, this August 26th through the 28th. All information can be found in the description below. You won't want to miss this. August 20.